Hi, and welcome to a bonus episode of the Seek Sustainable Japan podcast.、Uh, this is audio that I took at a really interesting panel、uh, I was the moderator for at the Minka Summit 2024 this year in Hanase Village in rural Kyoto.、Uh, this happened on April 20th, Saturday, the second day of the three day event. And it was in 1 30 in the afternoon, parallel discussions、uh, between Shelly Clark, Brett Rasmussen, Jeremy Phillips, and Marcus Cancellini. And they all have diverse and interesting points of view about the topic. Connecting with the legacy of your Minka is the topic. And in the beginning of the session, Shelly Clark gave us an explanation of what exactly that means. And then、uh, Jeremy Phillips started speaking, and then Brett, and then Shelly, and then、uh, Marcus Consolini at the end. I hope you get、um, some great takeaways from the, the discussion and the many insights that they had. Unfortunately,、uh, there are things referred to in the talk. Uh, which you can't see in the podcast version, but I'm so happy that I was able to record、uh, their great insights and information to share with a wider audience. And note to self that next year I want to set up a video camera. I know there were a lot of people who really wanted to hear、uh, what the great panelists and speakers were saying,、uh, who unfortunately couldn't make it to the event themselves this year. Uh, and even spreading these ideas around internationally has a lot of merit. All right, welcome everyone. This is Connecting with the Legacy of Your Minka. Are you in the right place? Yes? Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. <laughs>、um, so I'm JJ Walsh, I am based in Hiroshima. I run a talk show and I've interviewed almost all of the panelists today except Marcus. But I hope, Marcus, you will be on my show soon. It all depends on how well we perform. All right, let's do it. Let's、Pressure、do it. <laughs> Now, before we start,、uh, Shelly has a little explanation about what exactly we're going to talk about. Yeah? Yeah. All、okay. right, go ahead. I now have some slides. Okay. Yeah,、uh, thank you for coming. I'm not sure that the title of this.、Uh, Session was really clear, so I wanted to start with some slides to explain what it is we're going to try to talk about today. All right,、um, in attending the previous coming to summits, I was struck by the different kinds of roles that people take on with relation to their makeup. And the, the one that we most commonly talk about is that of homeowner. We're buying the makeup as a place to live, so we talk about how we find it, how we purchase it, how we renovate it, and maybe some of the DIY skills that we pick up along the way. Making it livable, and the lifestyle that we、uh, decide to carry out there. And then there's also the role that we play of, of kind of a curator because we're appreciating the architecture and design features of it. We're trying to create an ambiance or a mood.、Um, and I think the prime example of、uh, the Minka as a, as a curator project is Alex Kerr's Amuchiori、uh, in the EF Valley. But of course, that's also a guest house. So that got me thinking about how we use the Comic as a, a site for our entrepreneurial efforts, whether they be like we're investing in order to resell or、um, we're trying to get new people to move to the villages. We're using it as a platform for selling services to restore or、uh, more commonly as a guest house, a cafe,、um, and as we'll be hearing about in other parts of this summit,、uh, maybe as a Contemporary art space or a community center. So there's all these different business type activities that occur there too. But the focus of this panel is going to be on our role as successors, and basically how we use the Kaminka, Kaminka that we buy as a connection between its past and its future that's coming through us. And so we are not only protecting the historical、uh, artifacts and, and features of the house, but we're also、um, carrying on. Whether we want to or not, the history of the property from the past to the future. So we have to interact with the community, we have to understand how that house played a role in the past life of the village. 
So it's not that uh, we have just one of these hats on at any one time. I mean, some of us are wearing multiple hats at the same time. And we're, we're not trying to say that you should be the successor and, and not a, of these, any of these other things. But think of yourself as the su successor as well as playing these other roles. And so just one more concept to introduce before we get started with the panel. Um, as the integrator uh, of the past and the present through our minkas, we have both tangible and intangible things that we're dealing with. The tangible is, is the things that are right in front of us, the architecture, the design, the objects that we find in the house. And then we also have the intangible. We tend to focus on the tangible because those are the things in front of our eyes, but the intangible things, they might take a little bit longer to come to the surface, but they're equally important. So the history of the property, um, you know, who were the past owners and what were their relationships with people around them, and like what kind of community are we entering into when we buy this community. So we'll be talking about both of these tangible and intangible things. And we'll be sharing our experience and we'd like to hear from you. So turn it over. Thank you very much. So before we start, because we have such a great small group. Uh, let's let's find out about you guys. So, who's living in? Anybody living in Japan? Everybody, okay. Anybody owns an old minka? Ooh, half the group, okay. And wants to own a minka, or just minka curious? I guess curious. I teach a little bit about sustainability. So okay, good. All right. Uh, ties any other academics? Academics. So our first speaker. Jeremy is an academic, and he did his PhD thesis in urban spaces and Meiji Japan. Uh, well, not much Meiji Japan, it's uh, more of uh, interwar. We were the one who were talking the urban development, urban ideas, urban, how to develop urban spaces. I'm going to try to keep this within 10 minutes, so I'll talk fast if I have to. Um, I've got three uh, key questions in my thing that I wanted to focus my talk around. Uh, when you buy a house that is not a modern house, it's not a house that's missing from your culture, there's going to be certain uh, alien things to it, so you can be curious about why the house is designed that way. There's going to be rooms and things in the house that no longer seem to serve a purpose in the modern age. So how do you use these? And of course we want to modernize. We want to be able to live in these houses and as, with not too much effort. Like stoking a fire for your bombing every night is going to be a bit, a bit much for most people. So, how much can we change? How much should we change while still respecting the house's legacy? That's like photo. That's my house. It's a um, Azumadachi style uh, game facing house in Kanagawa uh, Prefecture, a place where we get some of the bulk snow in winter times. Uh, this was one of the first snows of winter a few years ago. So, first of all, with this house, um, like houses, um, I'm going to focus on farmhouses, of course, here, because that's the sort I'm most familiar with, but these apply equally to uh, Machia, in places like Hyogo, Kanazawa, the areas that have them, or even like samurai house, if you are lucky enough to get hold of one, and if you're in the market, there's actually one for Samurai Kanazawa right now, for the 98 in the the Gyeski. But like most farmhouses, mine is fairly large, with a lot of rooms, and they're ranging size from 3 to 15 mats. So I don't know, what are we going to use these rooms for? Then we can quite be rude and be rude and work out what to do with them. But if you look at the history and the culture of the house, how it's designed, it gives you an idea of some suggestions of what to do with them. First thing to note is that, like you know, most traditional Japanese houses, it's divided into a family and a formal section public and private spheres, so to speak, like the, the newa, the, the doma, the chanama, the nanda, the bedroom, and that would be the private family aspects, whereas the, where the family was spent day to day, and like folks on the, in the chanama, for example, and the, so these rooms are, like, are fairly simple, no fancy decorations, the wood is left natural, the ceilings are plain boards, as you can see in this uh, photo of the, my chanama before I... Uh, Redecorated it. I, I left. I kept the same style. Just changed the color of the walls. Really. And so the walls and the beams—they're just left in the natural state. Opposed to that, of course, is the 
uh, formal spaces, the Zaski, the Hiruma, where people would gather, not just for family events and rites of passage, but the uh, neighborhood might gather for various events. And these, of course, are much fancier, as you can see here in the right hand photo that shows the, that's the inner Zaski seen from the outer Zaski. And they've got the um, Nageshi boards around the tops of here, these uh, decorative. They used to serve a purpose back in the old days. They don't anymore. They're just decoration. They sort of symbolize a nice formal room. And it's, as you can see, it's where the Butsuma, uh, the Butsudan itself, is also located. Again, I just put a photo of a Kamidana here as a feature that many of us today might not actually be using that much, but it's something you want to keep. So with this sort of house in the area, I have my house. I'm going to, the, you can see here how the house started to evolve over the... Uh, centuries, but the central focus of the the you near know, the doma, the family room, the central uh, room, and the butsudan remained the same throughout its uh, history. And in fact, one of the interesting things about these houses is that they have different entrances for the family and for the guests to come in the fancy rooms. It was something we can see similarly in the uh, Edo mansions, the dining room. The, or Narimon, the great fancy gate, and the, only the daimyo, not even the law, but only the daimyo will be going through. But, um, so, and that last diagram too, you can see another inga on the uh, left side, which would be the south side. The priest could enter there, going directly to the uh, butsuma. And basically, the, the quicker you could get to your main room, the more important you were. Like here we see the Omari Mon goes straight to the Zashi, whereas the main gate goes to the Genkan. Mm. So. Can I just pause for a second? Everybody following the terms he's using? Uh, and... Probably not. These guys are from Thailand. Thailand, okay. So, uh, okay, yeah. thank you. So, so, okay. Sorry, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, the, so the Engawa, mm. the outdoor yeah, corridor. The, yeah, the uh, bit, bit around. Sort of like the hallway or outside. Yeah, the outside, the sort of semi enclosed veranda thing. But like here on and here you can see two examples. And the Butsudan the is Butsu. the altar? Like a yeah, the Buddhist, Buddhist, Buddhist altar. altar. Yeah, this is the Butsudan. The every Japanese house. Yeah, yeah. And the Kamidana is the Shinto one. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. It's like the Hiroma and the Butsudan, the heart of the house as we saw those uh, diagrams. And well, the Hiruma can, of course, retain its role even today as a main entertainment room. Things like the Butsudan. Uh, what are you going to do with the Butsudan? Um, I'm not Buddhist. Butsudan to me is... I don't use it for religious rituals, but as a connection to the house's culture and the culture of the, that um, gave birth to it, it's, it is uh, an important artifact. So I do want to keep it, even if it's not actually used for religious reasons. Although... Some friends actually, I've got an Indian friend who sort of converted her um, Butsudan to a Hindu shrine for Diwali and so on, which is quite interesting. It was in use of um, adaptation. But, um, these, the Hiruman and the they were as rooms that were used for uh, traditional gatherings. It is possible that you could like, join them together in one big room and in renovation and in that respect, still retains some of the legacy, but it's not something I'd do myself. And other, other things like yudori. What do you do with a yudori? I mean, I, I wanted one in my house. Inside yeah, these fire pits. Um, they are, back in the day, especially in the Chanama, there'd be often been a yudori in the family would gather around that and they'd do the cooking there and uh, uh, you know, keep things warm there and they'd eat around it. It would be a family gathering area like the TV is today. But today, we don't really have much need for it, but it's still important to keep it, to retain it when you do need Like, once a year, maybe, it gets used. But, again, it's important to keep these things and use them, not just uh, remove them. In fact, interestingly enough, when I got, when I first saw the house, the erodia had been covered with boards. There were temporary boards you could put on it and then put a hold to tummy mat on, on it to pretend it wasn't there. But I said, no, no, I want, I want to get, 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 get those boards up. Got to keep it. 
So when you're renovating and reusing a, a house, and there's always going to be a need to compromise. And But there are certain uh, things to, that I think should be like avoided. Like when you... I've seen a few cases, one or two in person, some online, like on YouTube and some people taken the shell of the old house and have gutted the interior and put an entirely new modern interior inside it and while you retain the original structure of the house nothing inside is within it it's, just, it's a shell, it's a facade I don't like that and the other thing to do is, I think should be avoided is like you've got a nice tummy room here you should re- respect the fact that it's a tummy room and not just shove sofas and chairs and all that and they don't be like the Dutch at Dejima who had to live in Japanese rooms and decided well, I'm going to be li- I'm a European I'm going to put my tables and chairs and walk there and my boots on and it didn't impress the Japanese at the time and it you know I, I think it should be avoided if possible like what do you do but tatami are restricting in what you can do with them like I said earlier you can't put sofas and stuff on them so but I don't think there's a reason to expand them because I'm sure many of you pretty much everyone here would agree that the tummy have their own advantages. They're nicer to sit on, for example, and they also act with a bit of insulation <laughs> because underneath them is usually nothing at all but boards. Mm-hmm. But planks, floor, obviously do allow our Western-style uh, use of rooms in some areas. Um, it's quite common, even among Japanese. You'll go on YouTube in Japan and you'll see a lot of Japanese changing the tummies tummy rooms into flooring rooms and so it's, it's a common issue with everybody who owns an older building but in my case I've tried to keep the flooring where the flooring was when I bought the house it, it might have been tummy originally but it was there weren't there weren't any there and overlapping a bit of recent materials here of course but just I reuse the original planks just um, stain them in. so I can if I need to I can put a dining table and chairs in that room and it's still a Japanese room but it, it will adapt to a more Western uh, use. Like, you know, wooden floors or the tummy is uh, one of the big uh, questions you have to sort of think about. Like when I was sort of planning things out, I used um, CGI to sort of imagine, you know, which would look better. Because this room actually came, there's like, there three, there was, no, there was one row of the tummy left in the room, all the rest had been taken up for some reason. So was this, should, should this be tatami or not? I don't know. It was just like half and half. So. Um, and of course, another problem with Minka is not so much a problem, but an issue when you have to bear in mind is that in many cases, these were lived in by people, often the family or the descendants, right up until the last few years, 10, 15 years ago maybe. And so there have been various changes over the years by the people living in them to suit their own needs, the needs of the times. And these are not always done sympathetically to the original structure of the house, I've found, and rather the reverse is more common, to be honest. Um, so I want to talk, I want to finish off with just a, a case study of one aspect where I had to revert a particularly unfortunate change. I bought the house, they were walking from the Genga, and there was a passageway leading out to the Chanama, and a short one going to the right. And that was enclosing a nasty little room there with as, probably as best as seedling tiles and walls made of that hideous shore uh, fibre stuff that falls off when you sneeze. And the floor was uh, veneered plywood and low when you walk on it. So, you know, that's got to go. I knocked down one of the tiles on the ceiling and found these massive old beams. This room and the corridors were built on the side of the old Doma. So I thought, oh, they've got this wonderful space up there, can I get it back again? And since that new room was literally just a box sitting within a larger box, it wasn't structural at all, I could literally just tear the whole thing down and restore this original huge 15 mat space. And so that gives me like two rooms, each one 15 mats in area with four meter high ceilings. And that's the original space is that would have been there when the house was built. It's interesting to compare the, the formal uh, hiruma with its beautifully straight, uh, plain beams and white plaster with the mud walls and rough beams. It's hard to see this photo. 
unshaven beams in the Doma. Jeremy, if I can interrupt you, ask you a quick question. If I'm not mistaken, though, I, for people to know, I've actually been to his house. So yeah. uh, I'm just wondering, um, the middle, yeah. there was a wall there before, yes? Uh, no, there wasn't a wall. It's, um, even, back in the, even back originally, uh, in my case, it's, it's big glass doors now. Oh. But originally, there would be big wooden doors dividing the doma from the main hirama. Big. And, and, the, and the, if I'm looking at this correctly, the kitchen is off to the right? Yeah, off, yeah, so off to the right and up the back of it. Yeah. It's very different than when I was there. <laughs> but amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this was um, just after I got the room. You can still see the piles of rubble in the, on the floor. How would you describe doma? Earth floored room, it would be a, a lot of room. Yeah, it's working area. Working they area. Carry their, exactly. their garden uh, supplies or even with their boots on into the kitchen area. They would do all their work late at night and then take their shoes off to go onto the tatami room. Um, whereas now in the traditional Japanese house, everybody takes their shoes off when they walk in the door. In the genkan? Yeah, in the genkan. But with the doma, you would come in and it would be a work environment. It's essentially an extension of the outdoors indoors. Yeah, exactly. And just a comment about you, you use the word a box within a box. Yeah. It is called a box structure. Mm. And so if you do decide to go look at a binka, because you are a potential, um, you will see a lot of box structure. You know, imagine that you have Superman telepathic eyes or whatever. <laughs> every Behind every box structure is something like this. Yeah. And you find them everywhere. You just take it down and you'll see yeah. a whole new world. Yeah. Sometimes example. it's really beautiful like this, and sometimes yeah. you don't want to see it. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different world. <laughs> You've done both, right? Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> and just final decoration. Um, what colors to do the thing? I ended up doing the ceiling itself. That's not the original ceiling because there's actually been a the attic space was renovated into a, a modern space about 30 years ago, and so the original ceiling would have been uh, like bamboo just laid over it. So I, I didn't feel any particular need to um, be all that authentic, so I just went with a nice bright red. Gorgeous. Thank you. And I'd seen a few, I'd seen one, another house in the area, and also the uh, house of the Kitamabune, the shipping millionaire from the late, ma early major period down in further south in Chicago, with black walls with the, uh, the red Bengara beams. And I thought, okay, that's an authentic style. Because I, I like to keep things authentic, but you know, that, that's my personal line. That is, I mean, it's not a museum. I'm not trying to recreate the house as it was built originally. Partly because it would be possible. I have to rip up the concrete that was plastered over the dom up floor, for example. But I try to favor traditional design concepts to maintain the legacy of that house, but not slavishly. I mean, the original dom would have been the earth walls. But now it's no longer able to be used as a doma. It's now going to be a room for living in. I can't. I don't know the earth walls because they'll fall. You know, they'll dribble dirt and stuff into it. So they have, there has to be have to be some compromises made to it, but they should be with respect to the legacy with the, what the house is and what it was. So you know, when the original can be used, favor that. Don't just rip everything out. Except there are limitations to living in these houses. You're not going to live in a slick modern thing with everything um, electronic and sealed up and central heating and all that. And you know, don't force anything. The house has its own um, style, its own structure, its own way of being, so that, that dictate what you do. Okay, I think I hope that was within ten minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Thank okay. you so much. Burning questions for Jeremy right now. And we will take one question before we move on. One question? Okay. Yes. My hands up. How about heating? The ceilings look super hot. They are, yes. It's freezing so in what winter. What do you do for heating in the winter? Warm clothes. <laughs> We're snowing. We're snowing. Well, you know, one of the things you read about Minka is that they are so cold in, in winter. And um, I think that's Americans growing with central heating. I didn't grow up with central heating, we had like panel heaters in our rooms and that was it. And so if we were cold, and my mother was like, you know, put a sweater on. Yeah. No? Or a couple. Yeah. <laughs> a couple. Um, you, you know this. 
And you adapt. You you physically adapt. Mm-hmm. I live in Osaka. Go to Minka on the weekend with my little seven year old. We walk in the door. We can see our breath. You know, <laughs> you get on. By the time we get on a video with Auntie or something like that, they're going, "Wow, it's cold there." And we're like, "Not anymore." <laughs> you put on your coats and you put on a little yeah. heater. And it's, it's, just, cold. it's colder inside. It changes. Yeah, yeah. It changes. kerosene heaters can help too. Yeah, kerosene heaters. Well, we'll have more question time later. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, next, I think we have Brett and Brett Rasmussen, originally from the U.S., now based in Ojika Island in wow. Nagasaki, and uh, he has been teaching himself and learning with other tradespeople on the island and making a lot of the unusable houses usable. There is a big housing demand on his island. Uh, so he's going to have some real behind the scenes insights for us, I think, today. Okay? Thanks, yeah. Brett. <laughs> okay, so I'm uh, titling my portion of this uh, presentation as Understanding the Minka. Uh, and I'm going to kind of break it down into, into three sections. Um, first, regarding tradition. Uh, the second, understanding the identity of the Minka. How, how can you understand the identity of, of your Minka? Uh, and then ways of sourcing, using, recycling old materials properly, whether it's in your Minka or it's in another project, um, just kind of keeping the legacy of these materials alive, even if it's not necessarily in the same, uh, same location that it uh, originally was used, because that's also a, a tradition that... Um, is very visible in a lot of these old minka that the the materials that uh, they're made of were not originally built for that minka. So to begin with, uh, regarding tradition, um, this is a a little bit of my own sort of personal philosophy um, and how I I deal with with minka. And and my viewpoint is that it's a chance not only for uh, using and saving the minka, but also the traditional skills that are involved with uh, the minka, whether it's you know in 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 the construction of it or the use of it, um, there's a lot of different aspects uh, that come into play with with minka restoration. Whether it's the earth walls, the traditional joinery and the carpentry, the tatami making, uh, the making of the doors and windows. Generally, there's a different crafts person involved in you know just about every sort of aspect of that minka. Uh, and I, I feel that it's it's an opportunity to give these crafts people uh, the opportunity to to maintain a craft, to keep these traditions alive. Um, and and some of you may or may not be aware that that um, as a cultural heritage, probably a world a world heritage, the actual skills involved in restoring these minka are listed as an intangible. World heritage. So it's not just the structure; it's the skills that go along with it. And I think that needs to be sort of considered um, when you're doing this. I mean, there's a lot of great things that you can do DIY, and I do a lot of things myself. But but if you can't do it yourself, or you, you don't want to, or you want to support a, a traditional craftsman, um, I think it's a great opportunity to do that. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that I have here is certain lifestyles are facilitated by minka. So um, personally, I live a lifestyle that probably not everyone is interested in living and, and not everyone is going to. I, I, my life revolves or, or uses fire as a central component of it. So I make charcoal every year uh, and I do all of my cooking, all of my heating on my location in Ojika with the charcoal that I make every year. And so I, when I'm doing projects, like to, to try and... Um, sort of retain that aspect of living with fire in the house because most of these houses, especially the farm farmhouses in particular, in particular had fire as a central element of, of the house, whether it's the irori, it's the kamado, it's the, the bath, and a lot of the features of that house were built to accommodate the use of, of fire. Um, and maybe you're not necessarily going to live with using fire on a daily base, uh, daily basis in your modern life, but, but to have the awareness of why these features exist, what were their original purposes, how might you incorporate, or incorporate them, or, or at least sort of be aware of 
what the purposes of these features are before you go, you know, go and make decisions on what you want to change. Um, and I also list farming here because, uh, and, and, and others, because the lifestyles, particularly of the farmhouse, has also dictated the way that, that houses were built. So in, in the island where I do most of my work, um, there's always an entrance from the farm field directly to the bath so that when you're done with the day's work or whatever, you know, you don't have to trape your muddy clothes or whatever through the house to get to the bath. You just come in the back door or whatever, you know, strip all your farm clothes off and you have direct access to the bath. So thinking about those aspects of why something is made this way and, um, yeah, it can, it can give you good hints on how you might want to, you know, proceed. Uh, yourself, depending on your own lifestyle. Ah, just some photos of. There's my charcoal making <laughs> results. And the sheet sheeting where I do 99% of my cooking on with the with the charcoal. Okay, so moving on to the second aspect of of the talk here, understanding the identity of your minka. So there are some cer certain things that you can look for or ask about. Uh, when you're uh, purchasing your minka or after you've purchased it, you can, can search around inside the house. A lot of times these items are hidden and you have to sort of be aware that they might be there so that they don't get thrown away as you're going through the piles of, of trash that often accompanies the, <laughs> the, the purchase and remodeling of a minka. So you have the muna, the muna fuda, which well, I'll just go through them muna. one by one here. This is, this is the, the muna fuda, your you're more than likely going to find this up on the main central ridge beam of the house, so the very top horizontal beam on the house. Um, probably when it was originally built, I mean, every, every house was, was going to have this, just about every house. They don't always stand the test of time. You don't always find them you know, when you're going into your house, so you, it may not remain uh, intact. And the other thing that, that happens is if there's a major renovation to the house at some point, oftentimes the Muna Fuda will get swapped out for a new one. So my, my personal house has a Muna Fuda with a date of, I can't remember exactly, but Showa 45 or something like that. And the house is, is Meiji 2 or 3 at the, at the newest. And so when they did a major renovation to the kitchen, the carpenter decided that he wanted his na name on the work now and swapped out the swapped out the muna for them. How many years apart would that be? Like fifty? Between the first one and yeah. no, yeah. More, much more well, than that. Yeah. Maybe two would be about 1869. Short 45 is 1970. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a quite a wow. yeah, That's quite a big, big, big span. difference. Yeah. But some of the information that you can get off the muna fuda is is who usually you're going to find who is the main carpenter. Sometimes you'll have like sub carpenters, and I've heard of uh, cases like John from Somakosha. Uh, his house has just about everybody who was integral to making that house. He has plasterers, names, and yeah. stone workers, and yeah, I mean it's a huge, huge list of people. Um, but then you'll also find the name of the, the main owner of the house generally on here, as well as the usually there will be the date that it was constructed. And this one has the age of the todio, the main carpenter. Uh, he was 35 years old when he built this house, so some good information. And then you'll also usually find the, on the other side of the plaque there will be some sort of um, sort of uh, like inscription or, or, or writing here detailing like for a prayer for the safety of the house, you know, against fire, against disaster, that sort of more like religious um, uh, script on the back. Yeah. Can I pass it around? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here, I'll just point out one of the photos that I that I made here. This is from another house that I that I was involved in. You can see the date that the construction started right here, Showa eight, so the eighth year of Showa, and then the date when the actual ridge beam was put into place was Showa twelve. So four years later, it took them four years from the start of making the materials to the point where they actually put it to put this, the structural frame together. Do you know if local shrines or anything would be involved in this? Would there be... Like usually, yeah, there will be a... Ser I mean, when you do the Mune, mune Ayashiki, there will be a... Uh, usually you'll invite a, a Shinto priest along, or would have. These days, it's often a more sort of truncated right. um, 
uh, ritual, and oftentimes even the carpenter will just do it himself. He'll put together a little, you know, mini altar kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and then another thing that you can find is the zuita. This is a, a little bit more rare find. This is um, one from a project that I was involved in and um, was given the opportunity to go and sort of salvage materials from. Uh, and this is a basically a, a blueprint that's done on a wooden board, usually by the lead carpenter, uh, and it tells you the exact location and layout of every structural part of the house. And it's laid out on a grid system. The grid system is always the same. It's going to have numbers on one axis, an axis, and it's going to have uh, Japanese characters on the other axis. And that's going to tell you exactly, you know, it's just laid out in a grid. So if you're looking at that piece of material, you know that this beam goes at location, you know, eh, go, or whatever. And it, that's, that's where that piece goes. And it'll often have different layers. So this is two different drawings of the same place, but it's just at a different level of the house. And that's because you've got horizontal pieces coming in. You've got other ones going vertical at different layers. And so you need to document each layer of, of that house, just like you know a, a modern blueprint would also do. So this is a, a nice thing to keep an eye out for, but, but uh, much more rare to actually find it still existing in the house. Is it all right? Pass that around oh, with it. Sure, yeah. That one, yeah, I probably will have to give it... That one came from a, a sort of cultural property that the town is going to renovate, so... And how old is that about? That one is, uh, it's actually Taisho, so it's not super old, but it's a, it was a very wealthy family and a very large, um, fancy house. Taisho, yeah, before, before the Showa period, after Meiji period, it's kind of a short, yeah, short <laughs> Yeah, still pre, pre-war, yeah. Um, another thing that you can find here is the Yaki-in. So this is like a branding iron. Um, usually the family is going to have at least one of these. Sometimes it'll be the family name, like this is the one from my house, and the original owner was Uda-san. So this is just the katakana shape U with the, the shape of a roof over the top of it. And this is what they would use to brand their sort of uh, possessions that they would maybe be using in, in a more public setting. So a lot of times I'll find the brand mark on the steaming... Uh, boxes that are used for like mochi making and, and that sort of thing and then the actual boxes, wooden boxes that you put the mochi in and a lot of times these were sort of community events and so you've got people from different families you know all with their tools and so you want to keep it all you know whose, whose boxes are whose and so they would brand it with this mark um, and so you can often find this and I often find these in what I would call like the drunk the, the drunk drawer <laughs> The oh, junk yes, drawer, the junk drawer of the house. So, that's the junk drawer. Yeah, that's another one. <laughs> but you know, mixed in with like thumbtacks and staples and all kinds of other just like random junk, you'll you'll often find the 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 family seal um, in that drawer. And this is this is just another one from a different house, probably more like the family crest. It could be the the family crest, or it could just be like the a symbol representing like the first letter in their uh, their name. Can I pass those as well? Sure. This one's a little bit delicate. Let's, delicate. let's just that one? Pass. Okay. Yeah, the handle might kind of. Did they ever brand of animals with these? Like I their... mean, the the cows and stuff were. Wives. Yeah, mm-hmm. were <laughs> the cows and things were branded. At least they are these days on the island. There are there's a cattle industry there, and I know that they. Um, uh, do or did brand them. I haven't found one for livestock yet, so I don't know how widespread that one. You can imagine still... all the parents the first night before their first kids' first day at elementary school. Sure, branding so you know, yeah. so. yeah. <laughs> It's still used in certain crafts, like sake. Is that right? yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we will brand premium boxes, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. brand, and we will brand when we do new equipment. We'll put a brand on it. Yep. And you can, there are people who will make you, who will make you the brands, you know, there still are the people making them, so if you, if you want, if you know the, or you want to make your own logo and brand your goods, then you can, you can do it yourself, or you can, you can actually, uh, 
hire someone to make make I your brand. That they started branding kids too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then and then the third and, and final part is just sourcing materials locally and, and how that can help sort of <laughs> preserve the legacy of of your place or maybe other other places. You can incorporate the legacy of other buildings into yours as well. And this is a photo of uh, an elementary school gymnasium that I'm renting out for uh, 1,500 yen per year, single yaku yen per year for, for this space, and that's where I have a lot of my things stored. Because I these days I get lots of just phone calls that are like, okay, we're tearing this house down, come and get what you want, and it's just like, ah, <laughs> drop everything and run and just like put it here temporarily until I get a chance to go through and sort it out and deal with it. Um, but so places that you can get materials, your own minka, as you're changing things, you know, you don't necessarily have to throw out these things. They can be used in different ways uh, by yourself or by others. Uh, like I mentioned, demolition minka, if you put the word out that you're uh, doing this kind of work, uh, people will give you phone calls. Word of mouth. And then in certain areas, there are line or Facebook groups that you can join, like a community Facebook group. And say I'm looking for this, or I have this. Does anybody? Can anybody help me out? Um, great ways to to get information. And then just quickly some photos of some of the work that I've done: salvaging roof tiles, floorboards from an old temple, these these uh, jugs and all sorts of things. A, a tomi, a, a winnower machine from an old farmhouse, and then using them uh, in different ways. This is an old hand so hands uh, sewn. Uh, board, and then this structure is something that I did with a, a Mold Moldovan woman who came over for an art project. So we built this structure out of all reused materials, and then there's a little earth oven on the side here that you can see, and that's all reusing uh, bricks or foundation stones from the from an old house for the base, and then uh, Tsuchikabe earth walls for the actual kiln. Using those, reusing those floorboards that I pulled out to build a, a counter in a kitchen, and this is a, a doorway where I, I'm putting in new doors or old doors from a, uh, a different location. And this was a sauna that I built at a sento on the island, uh, using probably about 70% reused materials, including all of the earth is reused. These blackened beams in the ceiling are all reused. So it's an earth-walled sauna, which is not super common in Japan. And then reusing doors over here from other uh, areas, including this little sliding thing so that you can allow ventilation in. And these benches here, the sound of benches, are the old entryway steps from a temple that unfortunately was torn down. Many years of trying to save that temple, but it, it uh, unfortunately decided to get torn down, but was able to get many of the pieces out to salvage them. And this is the view about 30 meters from the front door of my house. So, if you ever want to visit Ojika, <laughs> it's a beautiful place. Thank you so much. All right, thanks very much. much. So we're, we're running a little bit of short on time, so we're going to go to the next speaker and keep your questions for the end. Our next speaker is Shelley Clark. Uh, she is a trained ocean expert. Uh, she advises people around the world, international fisheries management specialist. Uh, she also, uh, through cycling, she's an avid cyclist, and through cycling in Shizuoka, she found this beautiful old property which she has been renovating. Uh, she runs a guest house and a tea cafe, which local people are involved. So really excited to hear what Shelley has to say. Thank you so much. Thanks, Joy. As Joy introduced, I'm the proud owner of a Minka in Shizuoka Prefecture. It's about an hour's drive from Shizuoka City, northwest into the mountains. And I moved to the village uh, 19 years ago, but I only acquired this property about six years ago because it had become an abandoned estate. And it's really more of a... I, like to call it an estate rather than a house because it had 10 buildings on the property including a 500 square meter uh, omoya which is the main house of the property and it came with an enormous but totally overgrown landscape garden with its own ornamental fish pond so uh, the village itself is dwindling in population when I first moved there there were 200 people and now there are about 70 Wow. 
um, and the, the estate is perched up on the hill, which you can't see from this. You can see the hillside from this photo, but you can't see the river below it and the fact that it's really looking down upon the rest of the, the houses in the village, and there'll be more about that in a minute. But um, the, the landscape is pretty uh, dramatic, and the property is totally enclosed by these tall trees. So if you leave your car behind on one end of the property and you enter into it, you really get the sense, unless you look at some of the fittings a little bit closely, that you're entering into a kind of different world, like a time slip sort of thing. And probably that's, well, that's the thing that I most love about the property, and that's probably why I have this really strong sense of history in maintaining the property and why I want to maintain that, that special mood. Oh, since we were talking about branding earlier, this is the brand of the, the estate. And the name of the estate is Sasuichi. So we use this um, brand, or Yago, as it's called, uh, in, you know, as a, the logo for various things that we do. So what I want to talk about today is five objects that I found on the property, and not only the historical significance of those objects, but what they tell me about how I should handle them the estate, and my relationship with the surrounding community. So the first object is this kago, or palanquin. Now you've probably seen these before, like in a museum, or maybe a ukiyo-e, <laughs> but I never expected to find one in a shed. Um, it's there in the, in the rafters of the shed, and uh, it's really interesting because the Sasama area where I live is not a wealthy area at all. So it was very shocking to me that this family, even though I knew they were much wealthier than the people around them, that they would have a cargo and that they would be hiring people around them to carry them in the cargo. So it really was a sign that this property was owned by people that had like much greater wealth and resources and privileges than the people around them. And so the message to me was, because my plan was to restore the estate with the help of uh, hiring village people and local craftsmen, I didn't want to re-invoke that wealth gap uh, status gap between me and the, the people around me. So I didn't want to become the new master and they be the servants. So this kind of comes back to me on a daily or weekly basis. And it's ended up with me taking on some of the dirtiest and least desirable uh, roles in renovating the estate. But I, I think that's probably the way it should be. The second object is this blueprint of the waterworks of the village. We have a, a long-standing um, system of water supply. Uh, it was found in the back of a closet in the house. And I didn't know what it was, but luckily uh, my handyman gardener neighbor, who you see in the, the photo here, he did. So he said, you should hold on to this. And I'm glad I did, because earlier this year we were experiencing a problem with the water pressure in the waterworks system. And we remembered that we had this, and we were able to put our hands on it quickly. And it was instrumental in finding where the leak was and restoring the system. So the message of this is that you may find things on your property that may not be important to you to keep, but they may be important to people around you. And so, you know, there's a limit to how much you can maintain, you know, how much space, and you need to clear things out. But if you can maybe ask people around you and find out what the significance of some things are, and then maybe preserve them as a the village historian temporarily. The third object is the Butsudan, the Buddhist altar. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, and I think a lot of people will find that their menka comes with the Butsudan that's been left there by the family. But mine came with something a little bit special and extra, which was the um, ancestral mortuary tablets of the ancestors of the family, which had been left behind very surprisingly and unusually. Uh, so obviously that needed to be handled, so I called the local priest and he came and uh, conducted a little ceremony and took those tablets away to the temple where they're now stored. But it started me wondering, you know, what else was there in, in the background of this house uh, that I was also inheriting without knowing it, the, the intangible legacy. And gradually the relationship between the, the family and the people in the village has become clearer over time. And I can say it's not, you know, in general it's not a good one. And that probably explains why the family doesn't interact with the village anymore. They are, they, they still live in Shizuoka, but they never come to the property. 
The fourth object is these uh, war documents that I found in this ceremonial box, way in, under buried under some trash. Um, and I figured out what they were. Are um, it's a declaration of war between Japan and China over territory in Korea from 1894. Oh my God. <laughs> so. Uh, I also found, you can see them there in the box, some other documents showing that the family had been contributing to these various war efforts. A lot of, Jeremy, you'll know there were a lot of war, wars going on at that time. It's kind of difficult to figure out which one they were donating money to, but they were supporting the, this um, imperial expansion process of Japan. And so I thought, you know, wow, this is so cool. I want to, this is great. I want to show people this. But realized that as I show... Japanese people, these documents, it makes them very uncomfortable. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people that I showed them to were quite uncomfortable with the kind of, you know, stirring of the memories of Japan's imperial past. So while we might think that old things that we find are cool and want to show people, um, they could have uncomfortable connections for, for some Japanese people, and we should, you know, approach that thoughtfully and with consciousness. So the final uh, object, not really an object, it's a building, um, is the private uh, Shinto or Inari shrine that's um, behind the property up on the mountain, uh, surrounded by 300-year-old sugi trees. And when I acquired the property, it was really rotting and falling down. And I first asked people in the village, you know, like, what should we do with this? And they said, everyone said to me, just leave it. That's all they said. But later, you know, as I was like, really? Just leave it? I realized what they saw in that fallen down shrine was the decline of the family. And it was almost like they got what they deserved, you know? So just let that bad karma stay there. But I had to decide, you know, do I clean it up? Do I, do I take it away and let the forest overgrow? Do I just leave it as it is? Do I rebuild it and try to create my own? new place there, you know, new karma for the, the new life of the estate. So I decided as the first project on the estate to rebuild the shrine with the help of a local carpenter. So we did that, and people have also cautioned me that um, Inari shrines are very, I'm going to say like, judgmental. If you don't <laughs> worship them enough, they'll like take revenge on you. So I'm, I've been told I need to go up there at the first of every month and give offerings, and I've done that every month except one for the last five years. And uh, every two years we hold uh, on Hatsuuma, which is an event on the uh, Shinto calendar, a uh, local festival. So we have you know, 50 to 100 people come and we give them lunch and play the koto or do some rakugo or something. And it's a mixture of village people and people from outside. So it's really a nice event. And I, I feel like that shrine is a symbol to me of the new life of the estate. So these are five objects that have taught me something, and I hope that that's been interesting to you too. It's a lifelong process of learning. <laughs>
and the interesting documents and things that we find in our minkas, but it's also the community. And that is part of the legacy, and it's a very big part of the legacy. So you, whether you own a minka, or you're going to one day own a minka, or even a house in a neighborhood, you should, I would recommend, in this country, think about what you want. What do you want out of that community? Because that will drive part of your decision about where you get your minka, or where you want to live. And in Japan, that's very relevant today. In other countries like Italy, Spain, also very relevant. I was born in Manhattan in New York City, not so relevant. Right? But that's why we're here. That's why we appreciate this. So community plays a part. So let me tell you a little bit about the community that I'm going to talk about. So first, I'm going to describe Diamond Brewery. It is running distance, in, it's based in Osaka, but it's running distance from the border of Kyoto and Nara. It is in an old community that can be traced thousands of years back. Uh, it's 200 years old, but its location gives me access to major metropolitan cities, right? Osaka, Kyoto, Nara, among them. The existing village, the old village that it's in, is 30 minutes away from Umeda Station, the heart of Osaka, with an original 24 village houses that have now been expanded to 320 houses. This picture is a picture of a festival that we just had last weekend. <coughs> the interesting thing about the festivals is no matter how hard I try, the majority of everybody who comes is from my community. So that means they're watching me. <laughs> that means that the local community reaches out to me and asks for help on certain things. Um, there is a forest ranger group that now is so old that my brewers will go out and help chop down trees because the old guys can't do it anymore. Speaking of community, you can't quite tell, but on the other side of this flag, my daughter is selling lemonade. <laughs> And right here, my wife is collecting tickets. So that's your community. If I go to the next slide, I'm suddenly in a minka. And let me describe the minka. I sit in a town called Nishikawachi, which is in Wachi, which is about an hour and 20 minutes away from here. The last house in the village. That means you have to drive all the way through everybody else to get to where I am, at the base of a hill. But there are three houses near me, and one of the problems as an American buying a minka in Japan is I want to be isolated and secluded and in the middle of nowhere. It won't happen in Japan. There's neighbors everywhere, and that's because they, they work together as a community historically to support each other, to farm, to protect themselves, to be aware, to take care of animals, etc. But I'm the last house, and yet the three houses next to me the occupants are all in the ages between 40 and 60, and there are two children my daughter's age. So for me, that is something that I took into consideration and was part of the decision factor about my getting the minka. My decision about Diamond Brewery and my decision about the minka that I, I purchased was more about community than anything else. Um, the other interesting thing is in this photo, uh, the three people that are next to me were the previous owners of the house. Now, the best thing about that is that when I met them and I got the opportunity to take this house, I was introduced to Fujita-san. The great thing for me is that all 30 families in the extended village are all named Fujita-san. <laughs> so it's been a very easy transition to know my community. Because really, on the plan, all the Fujitas and now Consolini. A little unusual. But let's talk a little bit about what you need to think about. So first, I think it's people. Do you want to be isolated or do you want to be part of a community? And that's a choice that you make. Because obviously, 
you know, the environment will respond to how you respond to the environment. But I forewarn you that you can't predict what kind of community is until you get there. And then when you get there, walk softly at first. Right? There's many different things that you can do. Um, but I walk softly in the brewery environment because Diamond Brewery, historically, 200-year-old brewery, is also the Diamond family, which uh, had sold the business, and then when I bought the business, I brought the family back into the business. But if I go to the local temple, and you walk into the temple, you see Diamond written everywhere. And if I go to the local shrine, you see on the tori, Diamond. So that influence is huge, right? And with my Minka neighbors as well, I'm going around to meet everybody and taking the opportunity to meet everybody. But again, be careful. I did it very openly. And that was my choice because I had a seven-year-old that I wanted to get to know the local environment. It also means that sometimes I have neighbors that actually just walk straight in my house. <laughs> really. And the reason is because over the past year or two of doing the renovation with my dykes on working on weekends and stuff like that, you know, I wanted to make friends with the neighbors, but they felt so comfortable now that they'd walk into my house. Um, so you have to be aware about that. Language, age, style. I think this is very important because as a foreigner, I'm always going to be a student of the language. Um, I can understand what my brewers and what my clients say pretty effectively. But the neighbors, my Minka, about 30%. So you have to realize that the dialects change and have an impact. The other thing is age, right? As they get older, you have to make a decision. Are you going to help them? Are you going to be part of their community? Right now, I show up last weekend, neighbor comes over, brings me a bag of rice. Another neighbor comes over and brings me some vegetables. But as they get older, I'm going to have to bring the rice, and I'm going to have to bring the vegetables. Organizations are everywhere in Japan, everywhere. I mentioned about the forest rangers. Farming organizations, event organizations, the village politics, etc. The village chiefs change on a regular basis here in Japan. Figure out if you want to be a part of them. Figure out what they do. Um, some of that comes with obligations. So, for example, when I joined this community, they told me, the year's schedule of when I'm expected to help with labor in certain areas of the community, which I accept and I welcome. But you have to make that decision. Do you want to do that? Is that something you want to do? Um, in some ways, it's good. In some ways, it's also bad. It creates a burden, especially if you don't live in that minka full time. It means you've got to be there at certain times of the year to go up to the shrine at the beginning of the month. Um, in order to take care of those things. But it's also a sense of fun. You know, it's something that you can, you can enjoy. Um, the other interesting thing, I think, about these organizations is that um, they will last to the last man. The Japanese organizations, until there's the last one man standing, or woman in some case, right, they will still exist. So they do exist in your environment, even if there's, there's only a very small community. So try to find them. Try to see if you can kind of help with them and understand their schedules and the things that go on. Village politics is interesting. Um, I have leveraged certain, let's say, uh, my position as a sake brewer to um, try to influence this local community by coming in as a rice purchaser. So I buy rice from my neighborhood and I use it for my sake. They don't produce that much rice, not enough for me to make enough sake from. But it's a start of engaging. The interesting thing is, when I go to them to talk about this, I go to the village chief, and the village chief, because he's a little bit nervous, he brings the last village chief and the next village chief. And then, after that conversation, calls the Japan the JA, the Agricultural Association, to include them. So understand that sometimes in your community it's quite big. You might think it's just one person you're dealing with, but everybody knows what everybody's dealing with. Schedules and time commitments I've touched on a little bit, but festivals and events, farming and gardening, um, seasonal work, 
One thing I'll say about farming and gardening that I think is very interesting, our view of what a garden or what a farm is is very different to their view. You might see pompous grass and think, wow, this is beautiful, it's idyllic, this is great Japan, but the Japanese hate it and they want to cut it down because they don't want the seed to land in their patty somewhere. So what do they do? They hose down everything on a regular basis and you're like, no, no, no. Don't be surprised if suddenly you show up and part of a mountain is gone for no other reason than they took it down just because they thought it was interfering with something else. So you have to take things kind of in style and think about it from their perspective. Communication. Communication is very, very difficult, not just for language barriers if you're a foreigner, but because people in the countryside have known each other historically for many, many generations and they dance. And traditionally in Japan, it's a very sensitive communication culture. Um, but you have to think about it. I just gave you an example of part of a, you know, taking down a forest. It happened to me where one day I showed up and the forest was starting to disappear. And there were guys hanging from trees sawing it down. And I was in a state of panic. What's going on? What had actually happened, although nobody had told me, is that the chieftains, these three, had gotten together and said, ooh, he's invested a lot of time and energy into this house. We have to clear the area so there's no danger of any trees coming down. Now me, I was like, what? I want the trees. I want the trees. <laughs> but they thought they were doing me a favor. And I'm appreciative because it did open things up. But I would have appreciated also the communication. Not going to happen. But that's okay. Um, gifts and generosity, commitment, these kinds of things. I'm sure you have done a lot of that in your day, giving gifts to the locals. You know, we, uh, Osebo season, one of the beautiful things about Japan, it doesn't have Christmas, but it has Osebo where people give gifts. It's real important to the sake industry, so please make sure you give sake <laughs> as a gift. Um, but it's also an excuse for me and my wife and my daughter to go around the neighbors and give a bottle of sake. Think about it, do it. It helps you build your community. Oops, sorry. The environment. Um, this is really important because the community has many different things, especially these old communities that have been around for hundreds of years. Grave sites, property borders, land maintenance, you know, somebody owns that but they don't remember who owns it, so you couldn't buy it even if you wanted to buy it. Um, land maintenance, okay, the part of the land that's next to me is by an unknown owner, but now that I'm there, everybody expects me to mow it, right? So, Learn about these things. Fences and community barriers, why do they have them? Um, and a lot of reasons, it's because of animals and things like that. So you just have to ask these questions because it's relative to your community. I also add animals and pests. Um, I recently was um, uh, in my neighborhood. They had captured a deer um, and it was in a cage. And so uh, they called the hunter and the hunter came and disposed of the deer. But the hunter is 82 years old, um, and he's doing what he's supposed to be doing. So I went down, and I helped him carry the deer from the cage all the way to his car. Right? Those things will happen. You can't be too squeamish if you're living in these kinds of environments. And then when I say pests, it's still part of your community. There are lots of insects and lots of things going around, which means for my community that my wife only goes to the minka, when it's cool and the insects are not there. <laughs> but it's still part of my community. And this is all part of the legacy that you will experience and hopefully it'll be a good one and a joy um, as you develop these projects. So last, who and what is your community? Good luck with that. Um, and obviously you've met some great people hopefully at this summit that can help you reach out and talk to us and uh, yeah. The panelists, lots of different insights and different views about heritage and community and minka. Anyone? Wow. Okay, panelists, you want to ask each other any questions? Go ahead. 
Why are the Zuita, why are the done on planks, not paper? Uh, oh, why are the Zuita done on planks and not paper? More durable. Yeah, it's a longer lasting. Uh, the Zuita is somebody okay. has, the big one. It's the big, yeah, the big one in the back there. Um, but it's basically the blueprint that's that's drawn on a wooden a wooden board. Yeah, I mean, part of it I think is the the durability. Also, it's it's part of the identity that the head carpenter is doing it. So he works with wood, and it's you know. It's part of his craft and his materials is to use wood. I think the wood that makes sense with the carpet. Mm -hmm. On the carpet, I use wood. My I carpenter, wood. My carpenter does the same thing. He, and for all of the projects I've been on, they always write on wood. Mm -hmm. um, which could be interesting because when they write a whole bunch of things, if you cut it up, it becomes a puzzle for a child. <laughs> <laughs> And it's it's definitely rarer to to have carpenters that still do that these days. But they're they're uh, there, and, and Yamamoto San, who's a mutual friend of some of us, uh, still does it. And it's amazing to see that work being done, the precision that goes into it, and how all of that stuff is you know in his brain. <laughs> yeah. I I have a question. Uh, a lot of you guys have had quite valuable things you found. Right? Have you contacted museums, or is there like an authority that you would contact and check if it actually should be in a museum or something? Yeah, I, I found a lot of old documents in the house, and they went to the local history museum and got assessed and tra translated. But they're mostly financial records of the family, so they're not of community interest, so they came back to me eventually. Mm -hmm. But I've also, something I could have talked about is like appraisal because that's quite a sensitive thing. You, you definitely want to have an appraiser that you trust, because I, I'm not interested in selling anything, but I had a friend who was wanted to introduce an appraiser to me, so I let the appraiser come, and he was going through, and I realized as he was saying, no, no, that's not interesting, is that he was only serving a particular market, and that was Chinese people with a lot of money wanting to buy things that had a Chinese connection for history. Mm -hmm. So he actually found something that he thought was valuable, but it had been on a kakijiku, on a scroll, and the scroll was all falling apart, so I had cut it out and put it in a frame, and he said, oh, you ruined that. <laughs> but I was protecting the picture, <laughs> and if I had left it in its dilapidated state, he said it, was, it would have been worth a lot of money. But, you know, whether something's worth a lot of money depends on who wants to buy it. You know, yeah. so it's not really a question of whether it's historically important. Yeah. So beware of the whole appraisal process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, on the brewery, we have found, I mean, a tremendous amount of old family stuff, including the Lutzudan that's in, you know, inlet gold and stuff. Um, but it's, you know, bringing the family back into the business, it's, it's still theirs. Like, that's, that's the way I look at it. I wouldn't touch that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just... I've looked through it and I have an idea, you know, drawers and drawers of amazing kimonos that will never be worn again, but I'm not going to be the one that moves it. <laughs> well, there's like, I'm from Hawaii and there's a great place in Hawaii called Reuse Hawaii and they have a big warehouse, it's reminded me of your place, Brett, mm -hmm. right? Do you ever bring people in and, oh, yeah. and say, what do you, what do you want to pay and well, that, take it home? Yeah. That, <laughs> It's not so much a, like, what do you want to, well, yeah, it does happen sometimes when I'm doing projects and somebody needs doors or, you know, whatever, certain things. I've got, like, stacks and stacks and stacks of doors, so the, the easiest way is to bring them there and sort of sort through it together and, you know, have the measurements. Um, but it's gotten to the point now where there's so many things in there that, that we have taken to calling it the museum. Uh, and the, that slide I had with the, the Moldovan woman who came over uh, to do an art project with me is, also, is a photographer and, and uh, does pottery. Yeah, the, uh, last one. that one right there is, this, this is uh, Olia. Uh, and we were in the last year talking about collaborating on a project to, um, she started photo documenting all of the items that are in the museum. Uh, and once they're all fully photo documented, then we're going to discuss how to sort of um, propose this to various museums and art institutions about how to make this into sort of some sort of. Uh, we don't really know what the final final project is going to be, but some sort of uh, whether it 
is a you know things go on display in in different places or uh, it turns into a book or you know what I'm interested in making a book describing the history behind those items, mm -hmm. how they were used, where they came from. Um, so there's actually yeah, an can... art gallery in the north in the outer northern peninsula where one of the displays they've used is they've got a, they've taken a whole lot of old um, ninge uh, folk objects and made. Uh, just huge sculptures of uh, them assembled in various ways, mm. lit up in the lighting and, the, and these objects, like anything from, like bits of doors to lacquered bowls and stuff, just assembled in structures. Mm. Mm. So, 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 the art, the aspect of these mm. moments was quite Go ahead, Shelley. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a question for Jeremy. Um, you had a slide where you showed the former. Uh, Madori of your house, and how did you do that? Did you discover it yourself and draw those diagrams yourself, or yeah. is there a place you can we can go to, like find maybe like the city hall or something, an old property record is this that can show? Uh, um, no, it's uh, it's different colors of different rooms on a diagram of the rooms. City Hall. Yeah, that, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah that, that's actually, that's, that's not, I actually, I, I nicked that from the um, a, um, Toyama Prefecture website oh. on cultural heritage. Yeah, that's, that's not actually my house. Oh, okay. It's an evolution <laughs> of that house style okay. through the ages. So, yeah. This is to Tonami. Tonami. Yeah. To Toyama. Yeah, so it's from Toyama Prefecture. So the to Tonami, now to the whole Tonami Plain and Valley is where the houses are. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I borrowed that. So you weren't able to find the actual history of your house's floor plan? No, and I, I don't expect to because there's just so many. It's, it's, a, it's a standard farmhouse. It's not some great rich family. It's not, not a brewery. It doesn't really have. It, it's an ordinary house. It's a beautiful Quite an extraordinary, ordinary house. Any, anybody? Questions? No? You guys have been great. Thank you so much. Thank you.